Thank you very much and good evening. Yeah, and as uh, Mr. Ryden said, this is the last one, and I'm ready to go back to Houston, Texas. <laughs> uh, before I start, can I ask you a question? Uh, for how many of you, this is the first time that you heard about the movement, or first time? And I believe some of you have been to Turkey, maybe, or participated uh, with uh, uh, some of the programs that the Dialogue Institution has here, Foundation has here. So this is going to be an introduction to a movement, uh, which some of you know. Uh, it's called the Gulen Movement, or Hizmet Movement in Turkish. What I will, will have here first, thank you. Maybe here. First, its definition. Second, its origin, you know, its history and activities, what they do, and its structure, and last, uh, the critics. There are people who criticize the movement, of course. So I'll, you know, that's a, a simple, basic introduction to the movement. Definition, it's a worldwide civic movement, you know. It started in Turkey in 70s, at the beginning, Adherents were mainly Turkish Muslims, but it has become a transnational movement. You know, right now the number of people increasing, uh, probably five to ten million. We don't know, uh, but the number of non-Turks and non-Muslims are increasing in the movement. Clearly, it is inspired Fethullah Gülen. That's why we also call it Gülen movement. But when you ask the people in the movement, they do not call it Gulen movement. One thing, Gulen is an Islamic scholar, a traditional Islamic scholar, and he doesn't like you know, his name to be used. And that's probably before, because of that, people call it hizmet in Turkish. It's, in, it's an Arabic word that we use in Turkish, from khidma in Arabic, which means service. What we pronounce as hizmet. When social scientists in America, especially, started to you know, study the movement, probably in 2000, early 2000, they called it Gulen movement. You know, it's it's a common thing that you know sociologists and social scientists do, because of the person founder or in, inspirer, they called it as Gulen movement. So it's it's called both Gulen movement or Hizmet movement. Uh, when we ask Gulen himself, because you know he doesn't like it his name to be used, and this is a definition that he gave, actually, to the movement. It's a movement, a movement of people united around high human values. It's a long definition, so we don't use it. This is Gulen, and I'll you know, give you a quick biography of him, uh, and also uh, explain the origin of the movement. Gulen was born in 1941 uh, in Erzurum. Uh, I'm sure even those who went to Turkey may not know where Erzurum is. Erzurum is in the eastern part of Turkey. It's a very conservative city, very conservative, very traditional. He was born in 1941. If you know the, the Turkish history, this is a time right after the you know, collapse of Ottoman Empire. You know, Turkey used to be part of Ottoman Empire. It was a large empire. Uh, in, Middle, in the Middle East, in Northern Africa, and also in Eastern Europe. Uh, although World War I ended in 1918, uh, and usually when we talk about World War I, it's Germany and, and the Allies. But Ottoman Empire was part of it, and it was on the German side. And they both lost the war. Uh, but it actually, after the World War I, after 1918, it, the war continued in the Ottoman Empire. And it was occupied by British, Italian, Russian, and, and French, and, and the Greeks. Turkey had, a, a, for five years, had an independence war against all these you know, allies. In 1923, Turkey you know, got its independence from uh, these uh, powers, and it established the country that we have today. Uh, so during, you know, before even before World War One, Ottomans were, you know, fighting. So 
It was probably 20, 25 years of ongoing war in that region. And it was not only a war for the Ottomans, it was also a civil war. A lot of you know, people are fighting. Today, there are probably 30 or 40 countries that were established after the collapse of Ottoman Empire. Some of them right after, some of them gained their independence from the allies, from British or French. So the country was devastated. You know, uh, a lot of people died. Uh, just to give you an example, you may heard the name Gallipoli. You know, there is even a movie, you know, Mel Gibson uh, is starring, an old movie. Uh, only in that war, uh, 250,000 people died from the Ottoman side. So it was a huge war. The number of people, probably 3 million people died. So, so the reason I'm telling this, so this is a time, maybe 20, 15 years after that happened. You know, Turkey was going through a lot of changes. So it became a uh, nation state. Uh, it, it turned to, from a multicultural society to a um, homogeneous nation state. Everybody was Turkish. You know, it was a, it was a popular thing in, in, the, in the Europe that everyone was establishing their own nation states. Uh, uh, give you an example, uh, maybe a funny, but uh, also a sad story. Uh, Greece and Turkey, after the war, had an exchange agreement. You know, we had a lot of Greeks who were living in Turkey, and we had a lot of Turks living in Greece. So they exchanged the population. Every Turk who were living in Greece had to move to Turkey, and the Greeks who were living in Turkey moved to Greece. So you can see, especially some elder people right now, who were born in Turkey, but living in Greece right now, vice versa, Turks living in Turkey, but was born in, in, in Greece. Anyway, Gulen was born, as I said, in, in, into a conservative uh, city. Uh, his formal education was limited, and it wasn't available, actual education. That's why I told the story, you know, uh, right after the war. It's, it was a new country, you know, recovering from, the, uh, from a huge war. So he only actually went to secondary education, but his education is, he's a self-educated man in a very traditional way. Uh, most of the, you know, the Muslim scholars in the history were, you know, they went to school, studied with masters, but, you know, were mainly self-educated. Uh, especially, and it's in the teaching of Gulen, he studied Sufism, you know, the spiritual, you know, teachings of, uh, of Quran and the Prophet of Islam uh, with great masters his, in his hometown. Uh, and uh, Sufism is actually not in, in a formal way, but in terms of teaching is very strong in, in his teaching and in the understanding of the movement. Uh, when I say Sufism, you can think about Rumi. Uh, he's a great scholar, lived in the 13th century, but is a significant inspirer in Gulen's teaching. Then uh, we have a system in Turkey. As you know, Turkey is a secular country, uh, but it's quite different than the American secular understanding. You know, in secular systems, we have two major divisions, or two major approaches. One is Anglo, second is French. What we have in America is an Anglo understanding of secularism. It's a separation of church and state, and the idea is protecting both from each other. But in the French understanding, it's actually mainly control of religion by the state. What I mean is, and I, I give an example, uh, Gulen, uh, right now Turkey has you know, a lot of mosques. Some of you have been to Turkey. 99% of people are Muslim in Turkey. And, uh, and each mosque has an imam. An imam is like a, a pastor or a priest who leads prayer in that mosque. They are all employees of government. They are paid by the government. I'm not sure right now, but you know, for a long time, they were actually, uh, government was, or state was sending sermons to them to read to the people. So that's the understanding that we have in Turkey. You know, state controls, you know, uh, some of you may know that you know, until recently, if you had a headscarf, you couldn't go to university. Or you, you cannot, or still you cannot work in any government job if you have a headscarf. Uh, very much like French understanding. French, you know, uh, had a huge influence on Ottoman Empire and also both the young Turkey. 
you know, uh, people in Turkey over certain ages do not speak English. You know, educate, they mostly speak French. Uh, English is a new thing. So we have American and English influence recently. Gulen applied, although he you know, didn't have that formal education, he applied to this uh, imam position. They had a test, and he passed the test, and he was assigned to a mosque in Adirne. If this is significant, uh, because as I said, he was born in the eastern part of Turkey, a very conservative city, but at the age of 17, he was assigned to a mosque as an imam second. He was young, it was a big mosque in the western part of Turkey. Edirne is, is in the trace. You know, Turkey has land in both in Europe and in Asia. This Edirne is on the Bulgarian border. So it's, it's very different than where he was born. It's a very liberal city, you know, European kind of city. So he became very active, socially active in that city, but also, you know, continued his education. He not only studied Islamic sciences, but also studied Western philosophies and literature became very active. Later on, he was assigned to another Western city, Izmir. Those who went to Turkey know Izmir. Izmir is Smyrna in in Bible. It's one of the you know the Ephesus seven churches in the Bible. It's again a Western city. It's on the Asian coast. Very modern, very liberal city compared to Erzurum. And this is the actually the founding of the movement, you know. People ask me, you know, uh, how come, you know, this movement, you know, uh, reached this huge number in a short time? And as a social scientist, you know, my explanation is actually, Gulen was at the right place, at the right time, and said the right things. In, in the 70s, Turkish population probably 80 or 90 percent were living in rural areas. Only maybe 15, 20 or 10 percent were living in cities. And those who were living in the rural areas didn't have much. So we saw a huge immigration from rural areas to the cities. You know, I remember when I was a child, you know, 80s. Even it continued in 80s. They were actually talking about banning. You know, having police waiting on highways, getting into Istanbul to stop people to move into the city. That huge uh, immigration. We have a, a saying in Turkish, Gece and those who are Turks who may know, know the word, it means overnight, kind of, or built overnight. People were coming to the cities from villages and building houses illegally overnight. And I'm not talking about, you know, small numbers. 50, 60 percent of the population, because in rural areas, you know, ag the only thing they had was agriculture, farming, and it wasn't enough for them, so they were looking for jobs. But these people were usually traditional, conservative, just like Gulen, just like the city he was born. But when they came to, you know, this urban area, a modern setting, just like any other immigrant groups, they felt insecure. You know, I'm sure you met uh, immigrants. When they move to an, a new setting, they usually feel insecure. They usually stay together at the same places. They you know, form suburbs, you know, close societies, because they feel they are under threat. threatened by the dominant culture. So it's like we're losing our culture. We need to keep together. You know, you can see that in any you know immigrant group. So these people were, although it was happening domestically, internally, about the same. Then Gulen said, you don't have to be afraid of modernity. You can be both traditional and also modern. And that actually provided a comfort to those people. And it was coming from a religious scholar, which they respect. A social scientist could have said that, but it wouldn't be that effective. Again, I'm talking about you know, a population, a conservative, a traditional, conservative work coming to a new modern setting. And then he became also very active. Uh, then uh, in Izmir, uh, he was appointed as a preacher. The, the difference between an imam and preacher in Turkey, 
you know, uh, an imam is leading the prayer. In, in the mosque, and sometimes he, he gives this sermon. But if a preacher, you know, is preaching, and he became a regional preacher, which means he was not, not stationed in one mosque, but he was traveling in the region and giving sermons. One thing about Gulen is, you know, he is a very, very effective speaker. You know, uh, when he was speaking, and he was speaking in big mosque, even to Turkey, you saw those big mosques, historical mosques, and thousands of people can, you know, fit in. People were coming to, you know, three days, four days before his sermon, just to have a, you know, place in the mosque to listen to him. And they, they started recording his, his sermons, his, you know, his, he was giving conferences. He was not only addressing as an Islamic scholar, Islamic religious issues, but social issues. So they started to distribute his records all over the country, and he became very popular. And then uh, in, in Izmir, one significant thing happened also. You know, uh, again, as I said, people were you know, looking for education. Education was the main thing for, uh, you know, for those who were living in rural areas you know, to escape from their you know, life standard. And they couldn't send their kids. Some of them moved to cities, but they, some others couldn't. So Gulen, you know, had the idea of opening a dormitory for high school students from villages, close villages in, to Izmir, who can come and stay and attend and, you know, then go to college. And that was the beginning of the movement. And those, you know, students, some of them became his own students. He was, you know, teaching them uh, theology, Islamic sciences. Some went to some other fields, became engineers and teachers and so on. Then in 1983, I think that was a, a very significant event. Gulen suggested his close friends or people who were listening to him to open a high school. A high school that is teaching, you know, having a huge emphasis on math and science but also teaching in English, the language is in English. And it wasn't easy for him to convince people. Uh, you know, uh, these are people who were attending mosque. You know, you could ask them to build a mosque. It was easy for them to build, but when you ask you know, them to open a high school. Having an emphasis on math and science, but also teaching English. I met some of these people who were actually in that circle. And they, I asked them, they said, you know, uh, we didn't like the idea. It, it was not convincing. But he was effective, so you know they said, "Okay, let's let's open the school." And they opened the first school in Izmir, in the west part of Turkey. And uh, in a short time, probably two years after they opened the school, first time in the history of Turkey, one uh, high school student in physics won a gold medal in an international Olympiad. So it became a huge deal. You know, uh, those people who didn't believe, who didn't buy the idea, uh, said this is the way we, we need to work. And people from Istanbul, Ankara came and talked to those who you know, established those schools. And in a short time, all over Turkey, they opened similar schools. Right now, probably there are over 150 schools, such schools, all over Turkey. And best, one of the best schools uh, in Turkey. These are private schools. Uh, I will get to that. And then the movement started to use media very effectively. This is a news newspaper uh, affiliated with the movement called Zaman. It means time in, in Turkish. And it is the, you know, it has a high circulation in Turkey, over a million daily. You know, magazines, hospitals, universities, schools, aid foundations, which I will, you know, come to that, and became very active. Uh, Another significant thing happened in 1990s. Gulen initiated in Turkey interfaith dialogue. You know, as I said, we were a multi-society, you know, having different faiths, Christians, Jews, different forms of Christianity, especially Greek Orthodox and Gregorian Orthodox community. Uh, but after the war, uh, Turkey became a homogeneous, you know, in terms of religion, society, we had ethnic groups. Like Kurds, but in terms of religion, 99% was Muslim. Well, we had, you know, because of the location, a significant, you know, uh, not in, in terms of population, but in terms of position, you know, the existence of 
existence of different communities. Greek Orthodox, head of Greek Orthodox Church is in Turkey. Patriarch lives in Istanbul. That's the, that's their headquarters. The Armenian, not the Armenian Patriarch lives in Turkey. The Assyrian Church, head of the, the Patriarch lives in Turkey. Also, we have uh, had a significant population of Jews, but also Turkey is a significant place for, for Jews as well. After the Inquisition in Spain, a lot of Jews actually were brought to Ottoman Empire. Right, and lived in Istanbul, Izmir, and Salonikov. So we also have you know, a Jewish community in Turkey and the leadership. So Gulen in 1994, the first time, met with these leaders. As an Islamic scholar, uh, I told you about you know, the civil war. It's a long story, but you know, uh, to be honest, uh, in the eyes of Muslims in Turkey, they were not looking at these minorities in a good way, you know, because of civil war, you know, Greeks and Turks fought. Armenians and Turks fought, and so they didn't look uh, these people, you know, uh, favorably. But Kulan met with these people as a Muslim scholar, gave the signal: these are our people. We live in the same community. These are our neighbors. We do not believe in the same thing. We are citizens of the same country. This might be, you know, uh, a simple thing for Americans, you know, but it was a big deal in Turkey, you know. Uh, I met with some of these leaders personally, the, the Armenian Patriarch and also the Greek Orthodox uh, Patriarch. They also made public statements about these events. They said that they thanked Gulen for these meetings because they said the first time in our lives we felt that we are, this is our home as well. We are the citizens of this country. And it was actually, you know, although he was criticized by some Muslims of doing that, but it was coming from men you know, uh, an effective Muslim scholar, Muslim leader. And then, you know, he appeared on more on public, you know, some uh, TV channels, newspapers did in the interviews with him, so he became more popular and more popular in Turkey. His books were best-selling in the country, you know, especially university students were at you know, attracted by his teachings. Uh, and in 1999, he moved to the United States, both with, uh, for some health issues, but also he had some political pressures in Turkey, so he chose to move to the United States. Since then, he is living in, in the United States, in uh, Pennsylvania, Pocono Mountains. Uh, and he has, uh, what he does today, he is, you know, we, we don't have a monastic life in Islam. I mean, you cannot be a monk. Uh, but, you know, uh, but you can have, uh, you know, a, a very close, seclusive life. Uh, this is what he does. He teaches, uh, to very few students, maybe eight to ten students, Islamic sciences, they read together uh, and he teaches, not a, in a formal way, but informally. Uh, then he writes, you know, uh, continues, he has over 60 books published. Uh, also occasionally, not very often, he gives interviews to leading national or international media outlets. But also, you know, uh, he's communicating with the world and the movement uh, by using internet. You know, this is uh, the website, you know, hercule.org. Uh, Weekly, uh, not a sermon, as it used to be in, in the mosque, but I like a, a, a conversation. Sometimes they ask a question, he responds. So weekly they publish and people follow his, his responses uh, from that website. Some of you may know that, you know, recently leading uh, magazines and newspapers published, you know, articles about the movement. Uh, New York Times had a cover story about the schools in Pakistan. You know, there are 20 schools in Pakistan and showing those schools as an example to, or alternative to radical, you know, madrasas in Pakistan. The Economist, Forbes, Foreign Policy, Washington Post, uh, Gulen, actually right after the 9-11, uh, Gulen gave an, uh, an, an ad on Washington Post condemning the attacks and the, and the terror. And this is an actually... A piece of that. This year, he was <clears throat> among 100 persons, most influential person of, of the Times list. In 2008, again, he was selected by Foreign Policy magazine as the 
world's most world's top public intellectual. Uh, in in Saudi Arabia, in the Muslim world, they're also they have also a very similar list. You know, the 500 most influential Muslims, and Gulen is usually in top 10 uh, in that list as well. A lot of testimonials from other leaders, international and national leaders, his works, and the movement, its activities. <clears throat> Most of the, you know, it, it's very active, you know, almost every uh, aspect of the life, uh, but uh, I think I can categorize the activities of MOOD in three categories. And these categories are actually related to a statement or a teaching of Gulen. In Turkey first, but later on, in general, in the world, he defined as human beings, we have three problems currently. One, ignorance or lack of education. Second, disunity or conflict. Third, poverty. So whatever this movement is doing, you can put that activity in one of these categories. Education, conflict resolution, or intercultural, interfaith dialogue, and also poverty. I told you about the school in Izmir in 1920, 1983, and uh, these are private schools, you know, uh, funded by mainly local Turkish businessmen at the beginning, but they charge tuition, you know, uh, Depending on the location of the school, depending on the local society, 25 to 30 percent of students are receiving full scholarships. Right now, there are over a thousand schools in over a hundred countries. Schools in Bosnia, in Philippines, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Africa, in Europe, in America, all over the world, over a hundred countries. And they are the, one of the best schools in their locality. You know, uh, I've been to these schools, some of them, and even the diplomats of you know, other countries are sending their kids to these schools because they are the best schools. Especially in Africa or especially in those countries, you don't have you know, a good education system. They apply an international curriculum but also follow the you know, state or the local curriculum as well. There are schools in, in Bosnia where you have, it's not only education, but also coexistence. There are schools in, in, in uh, Bosnia where you have Serbs, Croatians, and Bosnians attending to the school, same school. Since the war, right after the war. You have schools in northern Iraq or in Iraq, 17 such schools in Iraq and also as universities where you have Shia, Sunni, and Kurds attending to the same school. In the Philippines, you may know, there is a tension between Christians and Muslims. But there is a school in the Philippines where you have Christian and Muslim students are attending to the same school. Thomas Michel, and a Catholic scholar who was the director of Interfaith Dialogue for Vatican for some time, also a social scientist, went to this Philippine school and studied that school and while you have attention outside, the parents of these students are fighting in a way, but they had a, a comfortable, a, a coexistent, peaceful environment school. That's why he called these schools as peace islands. In a way, there is you know, a turmoil happening, but it's an island that is safe, they can stay. Not only private schools, but also tutoring centers. You know, this is a uh, term that we use in Turkey. Uh, as uh, Mr. Aydin said, m my studies are actually, you know, focusing on conflict resolution and especially I'm looking at the Kurdish conflict in Turkey. That's, uh, you know, my main study. Uh, and uh, if you, those who went to Turkey would know eastern part of Turkey and western part of Turkey are not the same. There is, you know, a difference in terms of economy, prosperity, culture, you know, uh, and the Kurds are mainly living in this part of Turkey. And so there is a huge conflict going on over 30 years. You know, over 40,000 people died in this country. Uh, 
there are schools, plus these you know, private schools, but there are schools uh, and tutoring centers for those who cannot afford. These are free. You know, and actually you have to be, uh, or your parents have to be below a certain level of income in order for you to be accepted. I was there in 2011, and they had 250 such centers, having over a thousand students, just in Turkey. The second major category is aid for poverty reduction. This is an organization in Turkey. It's called Kimse Yokmu. You know. Uh, this act, you know, this category is not big as the education activity. It's probably new, you know, if you compare the education activities of the movement. But it's getting big and big, bigger. It's called Kimse Yokum. It means, is there anybody in Turkish? We had an earthquake in 1999 in Turkey. Uh, 35, I mean, 35,000 people died in that earthquake. And this was an actual cry of a person who was actually underneath of a building. Asking, is there anybody, is there anybody to help me? So it became a name of this organization. And in a very short time, this organization became the largest, the biggest uh, aid organization in Turkey. They, they do collect you know, donations from Turkey. Overall, you know, probably most of their donations are come from Turkey, but also in other, from other places. But they distribute to other places as well. Uh, in Africa, other places, they have a program very similar to Doctors Without Borders. They have doctors from Turkey go and visit you know, other places to have screening uh, operations, simple operations. They repair schools, clinics, build hospitals. Uh, uh, and they do not discriminate. It's not only for Turks. I'll give you an example. This is actually a, uh, a quite interesting story. In two, 2006 or seven, Peru had an earthquake. And this foundation has a policy. If there is a natural disaster in any part of the world, they start a campaign, whatever they collect, and take it that place. It could be in uh, South Asia, in uh, Africa, or in South America, or anywhere. And the Peru, when Peru had the earthquake, they started a campaign and collected some money. And they took it to Peru. And they built uh, 300 houses in Peru. But it became national news because they were the only international organization or outside organization that was coming to help Peru. So they ex actually they called the, the president, uh, and at the time, you know, we didn't have any form of relationship with Peru as Turkey. If you ask people in Turkey, they wouldn't know where Peru is, and vice versa. And then they invited the president of the foundation to the parliament. And he actually gave a speech at the parliament. And the president of Peru, or the probably president of the parliament, went to Turkey, not to visit the Turkish government or the president, but just to visit this organization. But while he was there, he visited the Turkish president, and they decided to have embassies in both countries. So right now we have embassy in Peru, and Peru has embassy in Turkey. And also domestic. Uh, this, uh, they were also have, I did an excellent research on this organization uh, some time ago, looking at the uh, funding. But I came up with a well, very interesting project that they have. Uh, when they don't you know, collect donations, they usually take the donors to the location that they, they, the money is going. It's actually, you know, it seems like, you know, uh, very simple thing, but what, what happens usually when they take the donors to that location, they donate more. First, they know their donation is going there, but when they go, they see what's happening there with their eyes, and they donate more. Another program that they had was uh, uh, family matches, you know, and this is happening domestically in Turkey. You have a you know family that's struggling with financially. You know, sometimes the father doesn't have a job. Or sometimes there's no father to work, and there are kids. So what they do, they find a, a volunteer family, a wealthy family, they match them together. So it's a match, no donation, but that family takes care of that other family's needs. And it's it's continued, not one time. You know, maybe after the kids graduate from university, or uh, 
I don't want to define the period. So that's also very good to me, I think, uh, program. And this is the last category, and this is probably the most you see in America, you know, interfaith activities or intercultural dialogue activities or movement. As I said, in the, the 1990s, started in Turkey, we then started the interfaith dialogue, and then it became interfaith intercultural dialogue. The people in the movement established, you know, the foundations throughout the world, very active in America. These are organizations, active organizations, or umbrella organizations in America. They do, and most probably some of you have attended, you know, dialogue dinners. People come together just to know each other. They do, you know, dialogue trips, uh, conferences, panels to educate each other. The main idea here is, you know, uh, we don't know each other, and that's why we are equipped with each other. When once we know each other, uh, there is no need to feel from each other, and that's actually just to increase that you know, knowledge of each other. <coughs> that's the whole idea, and also <coughs> accept each other as we are. We don't need to be the same. We don't have to believe in the same thing. What we need to respect each other. My brother and I do not believe in the same thing. We don't have the same life, but we are brothers. If he needs me, I'm there for him. If I need him, he's there for me. So we don't have to be ex and it's impossible. It doesn't happen. Within the communities as well, in the same community, we are different. But we need to learn, live together, and hopefully work together. This is probably a next step. You know, in, in Texas, uh, our interfaith activities, both the movement activities, started early, early 2000, 2001, and you know, a huge relationship has happened. And, and I, I hear from all sides, they say, we have talked too much. Let's do something together. You know, let's say there is a good project. You know, you can be a Christian, a Jew, or a Muslim, or a Hindu, and you will find a motivation in your faith to do that. But at the end, we do something together for the community. And I think it will happen soon. Uh, this is a, also a project in Texas. It's called uh, Texas uh, Interfaith Peace Garden, uh, funded uh, by the movement. It's under construction now. And you can guess the size. I think that's why they put the cars there, so you can know it. It's, it's a good size of buildings. A synagogue, a mosque, I mean, at the church a mosque and a synagogue at the same garden. They will be not functional in, in a way like operating mosque or church or synagogue, but people will come there, students will come there like a museum. They will visit all these places. Maybe they are planning to have a special you know, a cer ceremonies, maybe if there is an interfaith marriage, they can have there. So this is a, you know, a, a project going on in Texas. Uh, they do, and some of you have attended trips to Turkey as well. The structure of the movement, you know, how they are structured. Gulen's teachings are in the center. His understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, his interpretation is in the center. When I say Gulen, I mean it's not, Gulen is not unique, by the way. You know, it's, uh, it's a very traditional. This might be, you know, uh, a surprise to some of you because when you hear about Islam, and you only hear about terror, radicals. But those are marginals. They are not the norms. And his, this, this teaching is in the center, and you have local, you know, uh, circles. It might be a city, different city, or it might be different countries. Gulen is fired project-oriented, locally organized, and usually locally funded. Why usually? Sometimes the local community may not have the resources. Just like, you know, let's say in Africa they're opening a school. So they don't, have, they don't have resources in Africa. So a Turkish businessman or some Turkish businessman go there and fund the school initially. When the school is able to, you know, sustain by itself, it's funded by locally. Are they 
Founders, only Turks, mostly Turks, only Muslims, mostly Muslims. But there are examples of other people. You know, here recently, a, a Jewish businessman uh, from Turkey died recently. He founded a school in Moscow by himself. By himself, he, he founded the school in Moscow by himself. And also, they have an experience sharing that world. Give me an example. Let's say this is the nice teaching in the center, and you have local circles, local communities. And he has an inspiration. You know, uh, the colors are different because each local locality understands his teaching a little bit different than others, and that's okay. And as I gave the example of school, Grant talked about an idea of school. You know, he said this is a good thing. You should open a school teaching math and science and in English. And one locality, Izmir, liked the idea or didn't buy the idea, but that they said let's make it happen. Project is school. Locally organized, people in Izmir who local funded educators and businessmen came together and worked for that project and built school. They have an experience sharing network. So Istanbul, or it might be another city, saw the school, saw the project, liked the idea, came and built the school. Slightly different color, because they have their locality. Same thing happens in other places as well. Finally, the critics. And I have a book on this subject, and I will not get into details. If you ask, I'll try my best to address. Since it's an introduction level, you know, uh, I don't want to lose you in details. Uh, there are two groups, you know, uh, in Turkey who are criticizing the Grand Movement. And the strongest one is the ultra-secular elites, what we call them the East. You know, uh, when I gave the example of uh, Drulu and urban population, elites were living in the urban area. And they had maybe 5-10% of the people had the 90% of resources they controlled. But when people start moving into the cities from urban areas, through education, Gulen movement empowered this incoming generation. I give myself as an example, and I'm not unique, by the way. This is a story that you will hear from other places. My father, my grandfather was a shepherd. His, my father was a shepherd. And only solution we had was education. I have five sisters and four brothers. I'm the ten. Only two youngest, my, myself, the youngest, and my brother had the chance to go to a school, education. He became a doctor. I became a PhD and still continue. But this is not a unique story. But before, my father didn't have any chance. Maybe it's getting too personal, but I, I gotta tell you this. You know, uh, he's, I, my father was an, actually, he's, he's a very smart person. When he was in the middle of primary school, third grade, and he was a good student, my grandparents took him from school and gave him as a shepherd aide, not shepherd, probably nine, eight years old, the third grade, as a shepherd aide, not because of, you know, to make some money, because they couldn't feed him. Just, you know, they were just giving him meals, that's it. He worked a couple of years as a shepherd aide. And that was the case. I gave the example of Ottoman Empire, the collapse, so that was it situation for most people, except 5-10% of elites living in the urban areas, controlling the resources, stationed in the army, in the bureaucracy, in the state. And they also, you know, enforce the ideology on people. We have a Kurdish problem, I said. I'm from a very nationalist, you know, region. But I study, you know, Kurdish conflict. I went to the region. Today, we have probably 15, 20 million Kurds living in Turkey. But you couldn't be a Kurd. You had to be a Turk. They you know, forced them to accept 
मैं एस भी लाया था जितनी पिछले बार ना at the beginning they even didn't accept there was an ethnic identity as kurd they said they are mountainous turks this is in the military books in 1980s i'm talking it's not that old but when people you know started coming to the urban places not only educated people but people started in trade business so it actually threatened this establishment i can understand why they are criticizing because they are losing power and that's the biggest group that criticizes the grand movement uh, the second group is a very different group and the first one is the radical islamist radical islamist groups they especially criticize the interfaith activities of gulen uh, they even say you know gulen is actually working for vatican you know, he is actually you know have with these interfaith dialogue activities he is making it easy for uh, vatican or christians to christianize the turkish uh, population uh, you may not believe but this happened uh, uh, in turkey in 2007 or 8 they produced a dvd saying what i just told you that gulen is working for vatican and distributed that dvd in every mosque in turkey that they published books magazines newspapers stating what just i told you it's a minor group but very active in america or abroad there are two groups that are critical of the human movement the first one is the xenophobia network you know uh, xenophobic people and uh, there's no way you can stop them I mean, just they can't and i think uh, we don't need to do anything us being foreign us being muslim is enough for them to criticize us and i think this is another big deal because this has happened to any newcomer jews had it irish had it whoever came to america had it or to other places not it's not in america but i'm talking about america so i think it will pass you know uh, it's our time it will pass soon hopefully when we have a new group And the, and the second one is uh, not an independent uh, group, but it is actually related to the first group in Turkey. You know, uh, when you were a businessman in America, or you were working in the state or the government, and you were doing business or having a relationship with Turkey, you were dealing with elites because they were the wealthy people, they were the state. So if you are a state man here and doing this and all that, so they have a bond. relationship with the, with some groups and people in America so they are using that relationship to put pressure on Gulen or or the movement what they say these are actually these are from my book and from you know uh, websites books you know uh, those who are interested to know about you know I I mean I think I have a couple of copies I can give to the, to those who want to have the first group in Turkey and uh, they their friends or their friends in America do not say this over here they usually say you know Gulen is establishing a radical Islamic country in Turkey he will actually turn the secular system to an Iran like country but in Turkey they say Gulen is in America and he is working for America CIA is funding Gulen. There are books, you know, uh, and it was, you know, proven. There are evidences. Some of the authors were paid by the military. Were, his books were bought by the military and distributed freely. And it just say one of the books it says Imam in America. You know, behind, you know, White House, Gulen's picture. So that's, you know, he's He is funded by CIA, but over here they don't say that. They say, you know, uh, uh, Gulen is, you know, trying to establish a radical Islamic country in Turkey. The Islamists are saying that, uh, you know, as I said, Gulen is working for Vatican. It's actually it says, who is this hidden cardinal? And they say, some say, some extremes of them, Gulen is actually a hidden cardinal. He's not a Muslim. He's, he's actually a hidden cardinal, uh, you know, hiding his identity. 
groups in Europe and America are saying that, you know, xenophobic groups are saying that, you know, it's like a Trojan horse, you know, don't buy their interfaith activities. You know, actually they will convert you. They will, you know, take over America within, like a Trojan horse, you know. And Trojan horse, by the way, is, is in Turkey. The movie is actually, it shows it in Greece, but it's in Turkey. So, so they show, you know, you can see the Eurobia, you know, uh, Gulen will establish a, a new Ottoman Empire covering all Europe. It should be Euro-Turk, but it says Eurobia, uh, by the way. So that's what they say. And I have uh, lots of examples of that. I've looked at uh, almost 500, you know, pieces, cases, both in Turkish and English, and analyzed what they are saying in my, my book. And th there are books on the movement published by you know, scholars in America. Uh, and these are some examples. And that's it. And I can get your questions. Thank you for listening. Good, we can go. Okay. It's either I have explained everything or nothing. I think we can. This is a, a, you know, a, when you read, you know, blogs and things, uh, they claim that there are over 100 schools in America, and that's not true. You know, as far as I know, there are three schools in America that are like the schools that I explained. Private, funded by, you know, uh, businessmen, charged tuition. But there are schools which are different, charter schools, and they claim that they are Gulen schools, and probably you read about those schools. But charter schools are, are, as you know, are state schools, public schools. And some of the founders of these schools are Gulen inspired. But I do not call them as, because it, those are state schools. They are very different than the schools that I was telling. The other schools have their own curriculum. They can do, you know, funded by the businessmen, charge tuition. Such schools, I, as far as I know, there is one in, New Jersey, one in Chicago, maybe two in New Jersey, I'm not sure, because there's a very high Turkish population in New Jersey. Not Houston. We are actually hoping to have one in Houston, but I'm not sure when. There are charter schools like that in Houston, but as I said, they are, they are public schools founded by some of the founders, leading founders, are inspired by Gulen, but they are not, you know, similar to these schools. They are public schools. Yeah, just like, yeah, exactly, just like you know, funded by the government. It's it's charter schools are like you know um, you may know this system more than me. You know, uh, it's a, I think a, a different way of government. You know, funding the public schools. You know, you have you know regular public schools, but you may have a foundation that is actually applying for you know, funding and establishing the school, but it's also a public school. I would like to ask Dr. Koch, actually, and also to maybe clarify tonight's forum through my question, uh, why is the Gulen movement important to us as an American? You know, why do we have to care about the movement, or why do we have to learn about the movement? Uh, or do we have to learn, or just what's the significance of knowing about the movement, especially as an American and in the United States? Thank you. I think it's a very good question. Uh, I should have addressed that. Uh, in a, it, there might not be an anything for you, 
uh, you may not uh, have an interest. Uh, <clears throat> there has been some studies, only 6% of Americans heard about the movement, uh, mostly positive, but some negative as well. Uh, bec as I said, some people are actually very active. You know, uh, as such, they are paid to you know, defame the movement, but mainly positive. You know, uh, I think it is significant because uh, you know, when we hear about Muslims, when we hear about, you know, uh, Islam, as I said, we mostly think, you know, radicals, terrorists, but that's not the case. And this movement is an example of that. You know, it's, it's a pro-democracy, pro-Western movement, but also traditional Muslim. If there will be, you know, uh, it might, it, this might be a naive, you know, idea, if there might be a peace, you know, and we are, we don't like people, conflict, you know, most of us at least. And this, I think this will offer a chance, you know, at least to have someone to talk to, who's very, you know, active in its, its mainland, but also, you know, open to talk to the West, to others. By the way, it's not only you know interfaith dialogue, you know, or Abrahamic dialogue. If you go to you know China, if you go to India, it's dialogue between that particular religion. I was in Taiwan. The dialogue was between Buddhist. Again, locality. That's that's there. So I think it is important. And also sometimes people ask, you know, uh, especially after the you know the terrorist attacks, you know, something happens. Is there any? Muslim, you know, or, or are there any Muslims who are, you know, condemning that or they are accepting that? And I think this movement is, is clearly says that and shows that. Yeah, we speak against Gulen, as I showed you, not only after 9-11, it was just right after 9-11, but every attack happens, he publishes or a statement condemning that attack and stating, this is important, that there is no way of terror in Islam. You may try to talk to radicals, but you won't be effective. They don't accept you. But we are Muslim, and we read the same text. And we, we say, brother, that's wrong. What you are doing is not in Islam. That's terror, and you shouldn't do that. And it's more effective. I gave you the example of Pakistan the, you know, on the New York Times. You know, when the people from the movement went to the Pakistan first time, they had a huge hard time. They didn't have, you know, they had ties. They, they didn't have beards. They didn't dress like, you know, I don't know if there's a Muslim dressing, but for them it was a Muslim dressing. They didn't, they didn't accept them. But these people were, you know, sincere, Muslim, praying, practicing, but they were not radical. They were friendly to anyone. There are 20 schools in Pakistan right now, very successful, and the government is asking more and more, or people are asking more and more. So I think it is good to know for Americans that there is you know, such movement, or probably there are others as well, and this is one of them, and very active, very dedicated. So I think it will help people to understand, at least to those who are looking for you know, friendship, who are looking for people to talk, I think they can find in the moment. Any other questions? Yes? Are there organized groups that are trying to identify There are organizations, you know, like uh, dialogue organizations I showed you. And they don't, the movement in general, they don't have a membership. You know, social movements usually do not have membership, but they have what we call social movement organizations. You know, it's an SMO, it's a social movement organization. That is an organization, an institution that is actually implying the goals or the ideas of the social movement into existence. So there are such institutions, many, especially, as I said, uh, dialogue. This is, yeah, 
these are these are you know uh, very active uh, very active institutions and they have you know uh, usually nonprofit organizations you know uh, umbrella organizations and this organization is also is is inspired by the teachings of Gulen. They, they may have membership as institutions, but the movement doesn't have membership. Are they teaching to Muslims? Is that the question? And also to, to the Muslims, you know, and he's telling you that if this movement is teaching the difference between the religion of Muslims and those radical groups. Yeah, I, I think I understand. Uh, yes, of course, you know. Uh, first of all, I think, you know, as a social scientist, you know, uh, none of the religions, you know, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, none of them has, you know, uh, that uh, cannot teach, you know, terror. You, can, you cannot survive as a religion. Maybe we had some, you know, cults and groups in the past, but they, they have, they can continue. I mean, no one, they may be able to attract some people, but they cannot attract a huge group. What happens with Muslim world, you know, and we are right, we have radicals, and I accept that, and I mean, you cannot, you know, hide them, they are there. In the, but it's actually not related to religion, it's socially, mainly socially, and you have that kind of groups in every religion. You know, uh, I have a friend who is a political scientist at Chicago University, he's well known for uh, his uh, studies in terror, the, the you know, the, the biggest or the terrorist organization that commits most you know, crimes is a, is a Buddhist organization, Tamil Tigers. So, so it's not you know, unique to Islam, so you have it you know, in every religion, but because of you know, the social changes that the Muslim population have seen in the last couple of centuries, you see those radicals. To your question, of course, you know, the movement is teaching its members you know, I've been to many churches, you know, we, when they have, you know, these uh, events, usually what happens, you know, this is a lecture, I believe, what happens, you have a topic, a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, come together, and they, you know, educate each other, and you have people from the womb there. It's not only, you know, they are, so uh, probably sometimes, uh, if it is in, let's say, in Taiwan, you have a Buddhist, a Muslim, if the, and there are, there's a minor Christian community. So they come together and they teach about each other to each other. So that's happening. You know, uh, I gave the example of school in Bosnia. You know, Bos Bosnians are Muslims. And uh, we all know that, you know, the, the crime or the genocide that they had in 1990s. For them, it wasn't easy to go to a school where you have Serbs. But in the school that the movement opened, Muslims, Bosnians, Christian, Serbs, and Croatians attend to the same, same school. So that's happening, you know, uh, not on one way. They're also educating, of course, others. And also, this is not a dialogue between faiths. It's a dialogue between the believers of faiths. Again, as I said, we don't need to accept each other's teachings, but we have to respect each other and respect that we may be different from each other. That's happening, yes. 
Yes, sir. What she was asking was, uh, is there is a program that the movement is trying to teach radical, radical Muslims people that this is not what you are doing is not true. This is the way. Yeah, what well, I think uh, indirectly, what you can do, of course, they are publishing books, many books, you know, uh, TV programs, you know. I told you there is a radical, you know, not radical in terms of, you know, uh, crimes and uh, activities in Turkey who are against interfaith dialogue in Turkey. But movement is publishing, you know, making programs, you know, that promoting that that respect in Turkey, in the uh, the, uh, the media uh, outlets are the biggest ones in in Turkey. So it's very effective on people. Uh, but also the school in Pakistan. I think it's indirectly doing the same thing. You know, not maybe directly teaching that, but indirectly doing the same thing. That's happening, yes. Other questions? I think we're done. Okay, I think yeah, we are done, and we really appreciate Dr. Kochi Dean. Uh, please give me a hand for this wonderful presentation.